amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I am found. Was blind, but now I see. In evil long I took delight, unawed by shame or fear, till a new object met my sight and stopped my wild career. I saw one hanging on a tree in agonies and blood, who fixed his languid eyes on me as near his rocks I stood. Sure, never till my latest breath can I forget that look. It seemed to charge me with his death, though not a word he spoke. My conscience owned and felt the guilt and plunged me in despair. I saw my sins his blood had shed and helped to nail him there. But all my tears were vain. Where could my trembling soul be hid? For I, the Lord, had slain. A second look he gave, which said, I freely all forgive, this blood is for thy ransom paid. I die that thou mayst live, Was grace that taught my heart to fear. And grace my fears relieve. How precious did that grace appear. The hour I first believed. Through many dangers, toils, and snares. I have already come. Tis grace hath brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. The Lord has promised good to me. His word my hope secures, he will my shield and portion be as long as life endures. Yes, when this flesh and heart shall fail and mortal life shall cease. 
I shall possess within the pale a life of joy and peace. The earth shall soon dissolve like snow. The sun forbear to shine, but God who called me here below shall be forever mine. When we bend there ten thousand years, Bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Singing it from beginning to end, you see a true testimony of grace. I truly believe if that were written publicly, we wouldn't be hearing Amazing Grace being sung as popularly as it is, because it really is the song of the redeemed. It's not just some general grace of God, but those he's purchased by his blood. All right, let's take our Bibles and look together in Proverbs chapter 12. As we make our way verse by verse, chapter by chapter, through this great book of wisdom, all pertaining to Christ. In this particular message, we're going to look at the house of the righteous. That's an expression that we find here, directed by the Spirit of God through Solomon. What would be the house of the righteous? If I were to ask you, what's your house like? I'm not necessarily referring to the brick and mortar or the building, but the abode. So that would be the way to look at this here, the abode of the righteous. And you could say, well, what is the abode of the righteous? But as we have been taught of the gospel, it's rather who? Who is the abode of the righteous? Here it says in chapter 12 and verse 1, Whoso loveth instruction, loveth knowledge, but he that hateth reproof is brutish. A good man obtaineth favor of the Lord, but a man of wicked devices will he condemn. A man shall not be established by wickedness, but the root of the righteous, or the righteous one, the one who is that righteous one shall not be moved. A virtuous woman is a crown to her husband. The word virtuous, I know Proverbs 31 talks about the virtuous woman. It's not talking about one's character as far as some kind of purity before the Lord, because we know none of us have that. But virtuous in the sense of industrious and zealous, in all that she does for the honor of her husband. That would be the way to understand this. A virtuous woman is a crown to her husband. And as we're studying this, that virtuous woman is a picture of the church, the one that Christ has redeemed, who is her husband, and how she is a crown to her husband. In other words, precious in his sight, because he purchased her with his blood. So a virtuous woman is a crown to her husband, but she that maketh shame is as rottenness in his bones. The thoughts of the righteous are right, but the counsels of the wicked are deceit. The words of the wicked are to lie in wait for blood, but the mouth of the upright shall deliver them. The wicked are overthrown and are not, but here it is, the house of the righteous shall stand. Let's have a word of prayer. Gracious Father, as we take up your word once again, I pray that you would cause us to see just the seriousness of what we read and the divide that you yourself have made between those that 
are yours by your grace, which we've just sung that amazing grace, but not without cost. It cost your beloved son his life, that he might satisfy your law and justice, and that you might be just and justified those sinners for whom he died, but also the whole world of wickedness, whereby you and your justice have passed by, and rightly so. Were we of that number, you would be just also in your condemnation. And I pray that as we contemplate your word, we might see just how good and gracious you are as our God, and how through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, you have established your house, not some physical building, but a family, a body, the body of Christ, made up of your elect from every tribe, nation, and tongue, for whom Christ paid the debt, and now you are calling to yourself. Oh, what a glorious house that is. And even to be of that number is truly of your grace and grace alone. I pray for your spirit to teach us and cause us to rejoice in your mercy and grace in all things. For Christ's sake, I pray. Amen. Now, the word house in scripture can mean different things in different contexts. Job spoke of the physical body, the house. So did Paul, that we dwell in this house, this tabernacle, but it's temporary, it's mortal. And like a tent, one day will be laid aside, wrapped up, and done. That's a physical body. But here, when it talks in this particular portion of Scripture about the house of the righteous, well, only those are righteous that God has declared to be righteous, and that in, by, and through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ alone. So you can read this in Proverbs 12 and verse 7 when it says, but the house of the righteous shall stand. We're talking about it being forever, not because we had anything to do with it. Just like I'm part of the Weimer family, not because I had anything to do with it. But God so purposed. And so it is, if I'm a member or part of the household, that would be maybe another way of looking at that word, how the household of the righteous shall stand. It stands because of whose house it is. If we're in this family, in this household, it's because God has so purposed by his grace. And Christ is the foundation. In fact, when you read in verse 2, it talks about a good man obtaineth favor of the Lord. He's the good man of the house. He is the only one who is good. He is the one who makes his household good and considers it so because he is the representative. In the true sense, we can say he's the man of the house. As goes the man of the house, so goes the house. Well, because the man of the house is righteous not only in his person, but in his work that he came and accomplished and earned and established. And so complete was that work when he finished it that the father looking upon that work was satisfied, satisfied on the son's behalf and satisfied on behalf of the children that the father gave him. There it is again, the idea of a household. Christ said, Behold, I and the children whom thou hast given. He was not ashamed to call them his brethren. So we see a contrast set forth in this portion that I just read here, verses 1 through 7, between this house, if I were to describe this house of this righteous one, as opposed to any other houses that men built, you have a contrast between what is righteous before God and what is evil. That's what we see in this particular portion of Scripture. If you look over in Hebrews chapter 3, you'll see some references, other places in Scripture, that speak of Christ's church as being a house. And I believe that's why I read here in Proverbs 12, we're seeing a description of just what is the house of God. Don't think in terms of a building. I know people 
were raised that way to think, oh, we're going to church is what they say. No, you're not going to church. You're either the church or you're not. <laughs> because the word church means the called out ones. You're going to a building, perhaps where the church meets. But the church is the household of God. We meet in a house here, but we meet as the household of God. I liken it to having a family reunion. Where are we going to meet? Not everybody dwells necessarily in the same physical house, but being part of the same family, you're drawn together as one because you're of that household. And that's what we see here concerning Christ. In fact, remember, Christ said, I will build my church. The idea of building, him being not only the master builder, but the very foundation. The entire house being of him. That's what we describe here. We see described in Hebrews chapter 3. Wherefore, holy brethren. Now, is there anybody here that wants to raise their hand and say, well, that's me and myself. I'm a holy one. People take that term lightly. If he says here, holy brethren, that word holy means those that have been set apart in God's holiness through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the word sanctified. Christ said, I sanctify myself. So our being set apart to holiness and that righteousness that he earned and established being put to the sinner's account, that's the only way anybody be, can be considered holy. So wherefore, holy brethren, notice partakers of the heavenly calling. That's referring there to when the Spirit of God through the preaching of Christ draws the sinner to Christ. That's a heavenly calling. Man doesn't just pull himself up by his bootstraps and decide to become a child of God. No, it's a heavenly calling. It is from heaven. It's, it's to heaven. Its purpose is exalting Christ. And that's why he says here, consider the apostle. There were many other apostles, but he's the apostle. All that came before him were but types and pictures. He's the high priest of our profession. How do you know that you've been called with this heavenly calling and that you are of this household? Well, Christ gets all the glory because it says here of our profession, that means our confession, what we confess. And it says here, Christ Jesus. I know there's organizations that spend a lot of time trying to put forth together a confession of faith. But here in scripture, it's all summed up in two words, isn't it? Christ Jesus. If I were to ask you, or someone's asked you, what's the confession of faith of Shreveport Grace Church? Two words, Christ Jesus. If you have not got that figured out yet, then you haven't been listening. Now that's our profession. He's our high priest. He's our, our savior. He's our redeemer. He's our justifier. He's our all, Christ Jesus. Now look here. As it continues, who he is. It says, who was faithful to him that appointed him. So that means faithful to his father. This is a household. Household has a father, has sons, has brethren. All of these are terms that we find used in scripture. And he was appointed to this. That word appointed means he was anointed. That even from all eternity, God purposed that all glory should belong unto his son. And it says there, even as also Moses. Now you notice was faithful is provided here in italic, which means that the translators put that in there, but read it without it. We know that Moses himself was not faithful. In fact, that's why he didn't enter into the promised land because instead of speaking to the rock, the second time, he smote it a second time, which is a violation of the type of Christ. Christ was smitten one time. But what the scripture here is saying is that he who was faithful to him that appointed him, that's Jesus Christ, even as also Moses was a type of Christ in all of his house. So you got the house of Moses, and then you got the house of Christ. House of Moses is a metaphor of 
those that Moses led forth out of Egypt. And it's a type of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. But notice what it says concerning Christ. He's the one good man of the house. For this man, it says, was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who hath builded the house hath more honor than the house. So there you can see how that word house is being used back here in Proverbs chapter 12. And verse 7, this is the house that Christ built. This is the house that is the household of that family in whom all those that God the Father chose and gave to his son now stand because of their relationship to him who is the builder of the house. Now that's a true hope. If we're not of this household, then it shall not stand. That's really what we're seeing here in this scripture. Verse 7 says, The wicked are overthrown and are not. Who are the wicked? Because you can look at yourself and say, Well, I'm just as wicked as anybody else out there. I have the same nature as anybody else out there. I'm by nature, just like anybody else, I have that nature as a wrathful child. So what makes the difference? Well, it's the one that stands as our representative before God, and that's Christ and his righteousness imputed. Otherwise, we would be just like the wicked of the world that continue to build their own houses, that seek their own refuge, that come in their own way, somehow thinking that that's what's going to please God, and yet... It cannot. I can't tell you how many times reading the scriptures now when it speaks of the wicked. Think of religious folk. The counsels, it says in verse 5, the counsels of the wicked are deceit. That's talking about false preachers. That's talking about false brethren. That's talking about people that their counsels, where they tell a sinner, oh, you'll be okay if you'll just say this prayer after me then you can be sure of heaven is your own name. That's that's deceitful counsel. That's pointing sinners to a personal decision or exercising a supposed free will in order to have entrance into God's presence versus pointing them to the Lord Jesus Christ. So everything that religion represents is wickedness and false. That's why Christ says to those religious people of his generation, that you'll stand one day and say, have we not done many mighty works in your name? Have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not cast out devils in your name? And he says, depart from me, what? Ye workers of iniquity, I never knew. That's the revelation of Christ in my own heart. When years ago, the Lord gave me a spiritual heart attack and stopped me in my tracks where I was made to realize that everything I had done, beginning with that false profession when I was a a young teenager, all the way to that point was nothing but dumb. And I'm like Paul, I say, until for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ, I count all those things as dumb. If you can find anything in your own works to be worth something, then the only thing that's worth is dumb. That's it. It's like putting on an old garment that's disheveled and ripped and torn, and yet because you've had it for years, you like it, I'm going to keep wearing it. It's like, get rid of that thing. That's what our works are before a holy God. In fact, we're warned, if you look over in Matthew chapter 7, not to build on a false foundation. There's only one house that shall stand the test of time and stand the test of God's justice. And that's this house of the righteous, the house of the righteous one. All other ground is sinking sand. You can see here in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 24. And you can see it's right on the heels, what I just cited for you, those that will say in verse 21, Lord, Lord. Not everyone that 
saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. What is the will of the Father which is in heaven but to exalt Christ? Run to Christ. Believe on Christ. Rest in Christ. That's the will of the Father. All those that do his will, that's the will he gives them to do. He makes his people willing in the day of his power. He's the one that who both works, he works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. We don't just will this. Notice it's the will of the Father. He that doeth the will of the Father, that means the Father has done the willing, and therefore you do the willing. But many will say to me in that day, verse 22, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? That's all about preachers. And the world's full of them. All using the name of Christ. See, this is where so many are deceived today because they say, well, our, our preacher preaches Christ. I hear him mention Christ. The question is, which one? Is it the Christ of Scripture? And is it truly Christ that's being preached or is he just a, a footnote over here? Every once in a while, yeah, we better bring Christ in to make this legit. <laughs> that's like quoting, dropping names like we talk about. Well, you keep dropping names and act like you know this person. And they don't even have a clue who you are. But prophesy in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils. This is probably the greatest deception in our day because the world is full of these preachers that go about and there's things taking place and you see people falling out and they say, well, the, I saw it with my eyes. Well, the question is, what were they declaring? Because if they were simply establishing themselves as being exorcists to cast out demons and devils, and the glory never was given to Christ, nor would it be in that in that particular context, then they're false preachers. In fact, way back in the law, in Deuteronomy chapter 13, God said he would send false prophets among them. And that when they came and they accomplished the things that they said they would do, but, you can read this later on in Deuteronomy 13, their message is to go after other gods. Don't listen to them because it's the Lord God that's proving you. And that's what I say in all these cases. I've had people come to me. I say, well, I just, I saw it with my eyes. You may have seen a lot of things. But just remember, God says, Paul, there in Thessalonians, that in the latter times, and we're in the latter times, that he would send a strong delusion and you read in that context what the strong delusion is. It's so-called miracles, casting out of demons, all these things that people pursue today. But the scriptures say that they might believe a lie. People want to be entertained. They want to believe that somehow these are servants of God. And Christ said of them, here they're workers of iniquity. Those that prophesy in his name, but prophesy falsely. Those that cast out demons in his name and yet do it for their own glory and in thy name done many wonderful works. What is it that drives social work today in the world? Feeding the hungry. You see those infomercials. They go on and on and on. That, that's a lot of money advertising that you see with preachers there showing all these pictures of malnourished children and and we need your help now and give. And everybody looks at that and thinks, oh yeah, this, this is good work. That's what Christ is talking about here. And, and they do it in his name. Do it for Christ's sake, when in reality it's for their sake. Christ says, then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. It's not that I knew you and now you've disappointed me, so I don't recognize you. I never knew you. Those that God has known, he's known from eternity in Christ. This means that they were never of that number. They were never of those that God gave to his son from eternity. I never knew you. And therefore, the only conclusion is, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. This is where the religious world gasps. How can you call that evil? Well, it's because it doesn't serve to the honor and glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's of another house. It's another household. 
And the reason we know that is verse 24, as you continue to read, therefore, whenever you see therefore, you go back to the context. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, what sayings of his? Well, listening to Christ and following Christ and resting in Christ. That's the will of the Father. He says, I will liken unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. Another way of reading that is, I will liken that one unto Christ. Because Christ is the only wise man. And that house that he built has been built upon the rock, himself being that rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, that household. And I love this. It fell not. Doesn't matter what Satan brings against it. It doesn't matter what the world casts against it. It doesn't matter even what my sin may throw up before God as being a reason for him to destroy that household. It can't. Why? Because of who has built it and upon whom it is built, the rock Christ Jesus. It says there in verse 25, for it was founded upon a rock. That's Christ. This is his household. This is the house of the righteous. But now, verse 26, everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not. See, it's, it's addressing these that were doing a lot of works. In their own name. But here it says, but doeth not what Christ has declared. In other words, coming to him, resting in him, shall be likened unto a foolish man. So there's the contrast when we get back to Proverbs 12. The righteous man, that's Christ, the foolish man. That's anybody outside of Christ. Now, it says, who built his house. Everybody has a hope but not a good hope. Everybody's busy about building their house, thinking that somehow they've got a house now that's going to stand. It's a house of man's profession is what it is. And it's built upon the sand. You can't have part in this house that's built upon a rock and at the same time be part of this house that's built upon the sand. The sand represents man's works. It's shifting. It's not stable. You wouldn't take and build any type of house on it. It's a false hope. And it says the rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew. You think about rain, floods, wind. Where do those all originate but from God? In other words, what God has established Whatever God throws against it, rain, flood, wind, he's directing it. That house, he's already tested it. Christ is called that tried stone, that true foundation. He's proven it. And therefore, it's approved of God. But men running about trying to establish their own righteousness, no matter how zealous they are, when God brings his justice and God brings his judgment, upon that house and beats upon it. It says, verse 27, it fell. That's always going to be the result. There's not any salvation what man proposes. And notice it adds, and great was the fall of it. That's the, the sense of, so great was the damage. We've lived through periods of, like that. I think everybody was just in awe back years ago when that tsunami hit Japan and the force of it and and brought down the nuclear reactors. 100,000 souls perished just by the wind and everybody. To this day, there are still consequences of that going on. How great was the fall thereof? And that's just one event, whether it's an earthquake or whatever. But think about the judgment of God. When God brings all of these souls into judgment before his throne, and they have actually no house. It's, it, it's taken away. Great is the fall thereof. That's why Christ said, broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be that are therein. 
And it says in verse 28, it came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished. Notice, not at his doctrines. Again, in scripture, that which is true doctrine is singular. They were astonished at his doctrine. This is what the world hasn't heard. There ain't doctrines of men, traditions of men, professions of men, but his doctrine. Thank God if he's given us ears to hear and eyes to see this one who is the righteous one and, and ears to hear his doctrine. Singular. What's difficult to understand about one instruction? We've said that to our kids before. What's, what's tough about you know, one thing I told you? The one thing is Christ Jesus, one person, one work. But all is in him. For he taught them, verse 29, as one having authority. Why does he have that authority? Because he's God in the flesh. He came to declare exactly what the Father gave him to declare. And not as the scribes. So come back here to Proverbs chapter 12. Let me just go down through here and underline some things about this, this house of the righteous one. The first thing is it is a house of wisdom. You notice it says in, in verse 1, Whoso loveth instruction, loveth knowledge. You ever run into a family? I've, I've run into a lot of them that they're always learning. The, the mother or the father always have the kids around. and If there's any kind of play going on or whatever, that's always educational. That's their goal. We want our children to be learning through life and experience. And so even gathering around the table to eat together, it's instruction. And it's, you look at it and think, wow, that, that's, a, that's a house of knowledge. And that's in the physical sense. But here, this house of the righteous is described as being made up of those who love, who so loveth instruction and loveth knowledge. Well, think about who that instruction is. In this household, the house of the righteous, it's all about Christ. I think about when those two on the road to Emmaus after Christ's resurrection were walking along and they were pondering everything that had taken place there in, in the death of Christ and his resurrection. And now alongside comes Christ and their eyes were holding that they couldn't see him. And so he starts questioning them about what they're, what are you talking about? And they had truly lost hope. They talked about the one who should have been the Redeemer. But now, but you read on down through that portion of Scripture, as he, it says, starting in Luke 24 there, starting with Moses and all the prophets instructed them concerning himself and the things that he should suffer and the glory that should follow. And it wasn't until they, when they were taken in their hearts by this, and so they bid him stay with them and, and continue. And so they sat around the, the table and he continued to instruct them. These were two of his own and yet how they needed his instruction. And it's when he took the bread and broke it and gave thanks that suddenly their eyes were open. They remember, well, that's exactly how Christ had done it when, when he was alive. And suddenly their eyes were open to see that this is the Christ. And then he moved on and left them there. And they said, did not our hearts burn within us? That was their expression of how they had been taught, how they'd been instructed. And they rejoiced. That's the description here of the house of the righteous. You know, we're always learning. It's that loveth is in the present tense. Whoso loveth instruction and loveth knowledge. Those that are true of the Lord's and members of his household, they never tire of hearing of him. If there's somebody that tires of hearing of Christ, it's because they're not of the household. You, you go visit somebody, you don't dwell there, and you might have a good time, but afterwards you say, well, I think we need to get going. So they go on, but the household stays. That's where you live. That's where you eat. That's where you dwell. That's your home. And that's how these are described. They love instruction. Tell me the old, old story. We never get tired of hearing. 
remember back in the beginning when the Lord first brought me here to Shreveport, we were meeting up there at Centenary College. There was a family attending. I run into this gentleman every once in a while, but he's no better off now than he was back then. But I remember after hearing me preach two or three different times, he brought his family. He had a big family. But as he was going out the door, he pulled me aside. He said, so let me get it straight. This is what we're going to hear every time we come, or is this just the beginning? I said, every time. It's going to be Christ and him crucified every time. He didn't say anything, but he never came back. Never came back. See, he left the house. He was just a guest for a while, and he went his way. But I'll tell you, the ones that stayed, are the ones that continue even today to tell me, teach us of Christ, instruct us of him, because in him is all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So it's a house of, of wisdom, as opposed to, you can see there in the end of verse one, he that hateth reproof is brutish. That's a strong word, it's like an animal, beast. Why does, do people hate reproof? It's not that you're whipping them and trying to correct them, but you're declaring Christ unto them, who is our wisdom. And they see that as a reproof. It reproves anything that has to do with man's will. It reproves anything that has to do with man's works, anything that has to do with man's profession. I've had people get upset and leave here because they feel like I've targeted them in their profession. Rather hold on with a death grip to their profession than they would to look to Christ. They hate instruction. They hate knowledge. But the house of the righteous is a house of wisdom. Secondly, down there in verse 2, it's a house favorite of the Lord. It says, a good man, a good one, obtaineth favor of the Lord. Well, there's only one good man. Christ said that. Why do you call me good when he said that to the, the lawyer who called him good master? It wasn't that he was pushing back on that title, but it was that this particular lawyer didn't think of him as God in the flesh and still trying to call him good. So why do you call me good? Then? There's none good but God. So here again, who's the good man that has obtained favor of the Lord? It's the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the good man of the house. And by contrast, it says a man of wicked devices will he condemn. A man of wicked devices is one's up to no good. He doesn't want the good man of the house to have the glory. He wants part of the glory. But I'll tell you, God will not share his glory with another. So this is a house favored of the Lord because of the good man. Thirdly, as we've seen, it's a house whose root is in the righteous one. It says there in verse 3, A man shall not be established by wickedness, as to do with his works and his way, coming as Cain did, with the best fruits of his hands, and yet... He was rejected. But the root, the root is something you don't see. It's, it's hidden. The root of the righteous one shall not be moved. Think about some of these trees that grow out there in California on the West Coast, the sequoia tree, just been there for years. The root is what is the strength of that, that tree. The foundation is what causes that the house shall not be moved. So there it is our hope. It's in this righteous one. Fourthly, it's a house whose wife is honored and revered. This is an amazing thing to stop and think about it. Don't you like to hear a husband talking about his wife and how precious she is to him? You know that there's love there. That's what this is. This is describing the love of Christ in this household for his wife. That's what the church is described as, the, the, the bride. He's the bridegroom. But it says, she that maketh ashamed is as rottenness in his bones. If there's a house where the wife makes the husband ashamed, then it's because of rottenness in the bones. And, and that means they have another head that's not a good man that represents her. Fifthly, it speaks there of the thoughts of the righteous that are right. The thoughts of the righteous one. In other words, Everything he thinks is to the glory of his Father. And all those that he represents, that he declares righteous, their thoughts are right. See, the word righteous has 
the word right in it. These are those that hunger and thirst after righteousness. Not our own. It says, but they shall be filled. And then, sixthly, down there in verses 6 and 7, this is a house that's founded on truth and justice. It says, the words of the wicked are to lie and wait for blood. I'll tell you, there are a lot of preacher assassins out there lying in wait for the blood of men. It's because they're not pointing to Christ. They see people as prey, like a, a hunting, going out and getting his, bagging as many saved souls as they can get. And putting another notch in their pistol, thinking, look at my, look what I've done. Look at all these people following after me. They are those that lie in wait for blood. The blood of those souls is on their hands. But the mouth of the upright shall deliver them. The mouth of the upright one, the word of this righteous one, the Lord Jesus Christ, is the deliverance of those of his household. The wicked are overthrown, verse 7, but the house of the righteous shall stand. It stands notwithstanding the sin. We know ourselves to be sinners, but Christ has paid the debt. It stands notwithstanding the persecution of the world or men. It stands because Christ is that head of that household. And it'd be sooner thought that Christ would cease to be the Son of God and be removed from the throne than for any one of this household that he represents that they should perish. Therein is our hope. All right, well, I pray that's been a blessing. The Lord's made it so. We'll be back here in just a few minutes.